Hello and welcome to another episode of Unworthy History. Today we got some more actual history for you from this book right here. The Pennsylvania German and the French and Indian War, a historical sketch by Henry Melcher Muhlenberg Richards. This book was published all the way back in 1905. Now today is episode four of this series I'm doing on this book, on the Pennsylvania Germans and the French and Indian War, and today follows up an episode where the Delaware Indians finally broke through into the settlements and raided and committed many depredations back around 1755. So today we're going to see what happens after that. The one man who seemed best able to cope with the emergency was Conrad Weiser. At the earliest moment, Weiser departed for Philadelphia to have a consultation with the governor. Although he returned as soon as possible, it was only to meet with bad news. What happened cannot be better told than in the words of his report, under date of November 19, 1755, in which he says, Honored Sir, on my return from Philadelphia, I met in the township of Amity in Berks County the first news of our cruel enemy having invaded the country this side of the Blue Mountains. I left the papers as they were in the messenger's hands and hasted to Reading, where the alarm and confusion was very great. I was obliged to stay that night and part of the next day, to wit the 17th of this instant, and set out for Heidelberg where I arrived that evening. Soon after, my sons, Philip and Frederick, arrived from the pursuit of the Indians, and gave me the following relation, to wit, that on Saturday the last, about four o'clock in the afternoon, as some men from Tulpehocken were going to Dietrich Six's place under the hill on Shamakin Road to be on the watch appointed there, they were fired upon by the Indians, but none were hurt nor killed. Our people were but six in number, the rest being behind. Upon which our people ran towards the watch house, which is about one half a mile off, and the Indians pursued them and killed and scalped several of them. A bold, stout Indian came up with one Christopher Urey, who turned about and shot the Indian right through his breast. The Indian dropped down dead, but was dragged out of the way by his own companions. He was found the next day and scalped by our people. The Indians divided themselves into two parties. Some came this way to meet the rest that was going to the watch, and killed some of them so that six of our men were killed that day, and a few wounded. The night following, the enemy attacked the house of Thomas Bower on Swatara Creek. They came to the house in the dark of night, and one of them put his firearm through the window and shot a shoemaker who was at work, dead upon the spot. The people, being extremely surprised at this sudden attack, defended themselves by firing out of the windows at the Indians. The firing alarmed a neighbor who came with two or three more men. They then fired on them and made a great noise, scaring the Indians away from Bower's house after they had set fire to it. But by Thomas Bower's diligence and conduct, the fire was timely put out. So Thomas Bower with his family went off that night to his neighbor, Daniel Schneider, who came to his assistance. By eight o'clock, parties came up from Tulpehocken and Heidelberg. The first party saw four Indians running off. They had some prisoners who they scalped immediately. Three children lay scalped yet alive. One died since. The other two are likely to do well. Another party found a woman who had just expired with a male child on her side, both killed and scalped. The woman lay upon her face. My son Frederick turned her about to see who she might have been, and to his companion's surprise they found a babe of about fourteen days old under her, wrapped up in a little cushion. His nose was quite flat, which was set right by Frederick, and life was yet in him, and he recovered again. Our people came up with two parties of Indians that day, but they hardly got sight of them. The Indians ran off immediately. Either our party did not care to fight them if they could avoid it, or, which is most likely, the Indians were alarmed first by the loud noise of our people coming, because no order was observed. Upon the whole, there are about fifteen killed of our people, including men, women, and children, and the enemy not beat but scared off. Several houses and barns are burned. I do not have a true account of how many. We are in a dismal situation. Some of this murder has been committed in Tulpehocken Township. The people left their plantation to within six or seven miles from my house, fearing another attack. 
Guns and ammunition are very much wanted here. My sons have been obliged to part with most of that that was sent up for the use of the Indians. I pray your honor will be pleased if it lies in your power to send us up a quantity upon any condition. I must stand my ground or my neighbors will all go away and leave their habitations to be destroyed by the enemy or by our own people. This is enough of such a melancholy account for this time. I beg leave to conclude who am, sir, your very obedient, Conrad Weiser, Heidelberg in Berks County, November 19, 1755. P.S. I am creditably informed just now that a man by the name of Wolf killed an Indian the same time when Yuri killed the other, but the body is not yet found. The poor young man Wolf has since died of his wound through his belly. The excitement among the settlers can readily be imagined, as well as their anger against the Indians. It so happened that on his return from Philadelphia, Weiser was escorting several friendly Indians on their return to Shamakin. The presence of these Indians at Tulpahocken came near being too much for the unreasoning people of that locality. It was with difficulty that Weiser succeeded in spiriting them away, and even in saving his own life. His experience in that direction is given in another letter to the governor, which followed immediately on the heels of the one from November 19th. May it please the governor, that night after my arrival from Philadelphia, Emmanuel Carpenter and Simon Adam Coon, Esquires, came to my house and lodged with me. They informed me that a meeting was appointed of the people of Tulpahocken and Heidelberg in adjacent places at Benjamin Spicker's house early next morning. I made all the haste with the friendly Indians I was escorting that I could, and gave them a letter to Thomas McKee to furnish them with necessaries for their journey. One Indian named Scarajude had no creature to ride on, so I gave him one. Before I could get down with the Indians, three or four men came from Benjamin Spickers to warn the Indians not to go that way, for the people were so enraged against all the Indians and would kill them without distinction. I went with them, so did the gentleman before named. We came near Benjamin Spicker's house, and I saw about 400 or 500 men, and heard a loud noise. I rode before, and in riding along the road, with armed men on both sides of it, I heard some say, Why must we be killed by the Indians, and we not kill them? Why are our hands so tied? I got the Indians to the house with much ado where I treated them with a small dram, and so parted in love and friendship. Captain Diefenbach undertook to conduct them with five other men to Susquehanna. After this, a sort of council of war was held by the officers present, the before-named and other freeholders. It was agreed to that 150 men should be raised immediately to serve as outscouts and as guards at certain places under the Kittanani Hills for forty days that those men so raised should have two shillings a day, and two pounds of bread, two pounds of beef, and a gill of rum and powder and lead, arms they must find for themselves. This scheme was signed by a good many freeholders and read to the people. They cried out that so much for an Indian scalp they would have, be they friends or enemies from the governor. I told them I had no such power from the governor nor assembly to grant that. Some of them began to curse the governor some the assembly, and some called me a traitor of the country who held with the Indians, and they said I must have known of their murder beforehand. I sat in the house by a low window. Some of my friends came to pull me away from it, telling me some of the people threatened to shoot me. I offered to go out to the people and either pacify them or make the king's proclamation, but those in the house with me would not let me go out. The cry was, the land was betrayed and sold. The common people from Lancaster County were the worst. I was in danger of being shot to death. In the meantime, a great smoke arose under Tulpahocken Mountain, with the news following that the Indians had committed murder on Mill Creek. This turned out to be a false alarm. Other news came that the Indians had set fire to a barn. Most of the people ran, and those that had horses rode off without any order of regulation. I then took my own horse and went home where I intend to stay and defend my own house as long as I can. There is nothing to be done by the people without a law or regulation by the governor and assembly. The people of Tulpahocken have nearly all fled. Another such attack will lay all the country to waste on the west side of Shulkill. I am, sir, your most obedient, Conrad Weiser. 
So these were some more of the events that were occurring in the German settlements of Pennsylvania during November of 1755. So once again, this is episode four of this series I'm doing based on this book, The Pennsylvania German During the French and Indian War. So if you want to see more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe. And we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.